Hello and welcome to the Cutler Anderson Corn Collection at Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. I'm Michael Washburn, the Seed Savers Exchange Preservation Director, and I'll be your host for this session. I'd like to thank Lacuma Design so much for sponsoring this session. So we're here today with Charlie Mixacek. Charlie Mixacek is a retired archaeobotanist, a former board member of the Native Seed Search and a research associate at the Missouri Botanical Garden, as well as a lifelong gardener. Now today, Charlie will be talking about Missouri's Botanical Garden collection of over 6,000 years of corn, some of which date to the early 1900s. He and his team are in the process of digitizing and, photo and photographing the collection to make it available to researchers and heirloom seed savers around the world. This collection provides a snapshot of past crop diversity at various points of time throughout the 20th century. Although the seeds are no longer viable, they could provide genetic material for comparison with more recent seed collections. Charlie, thanks so much for being here. All right, thank you, Michael, and thank you for that very uh, comprehensive introduction. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, Cutler Anderson corn collection that is down at Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis and why it might be a resource for seed savers. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional homeland of the Osage Nation and the Illinois Confederacy. And since St. Louis is kind of at the junction of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, a lot of people have used this area in the past. So Michael already pretty much uh, mentioned who I am. But uh, yeah, I've been a research associate at the Botanical Garden and working on the collection since last summer. So what is uh, the Cutler Anderson collection? So it was started by these two gentlemen, Edgar Anderson on the left and Hugh Cutler on the right in about 1940. And basically what they wanted to do was look at variation in uh, different types of corn, try to figure out how those different types of corn are related and show changes over time. And as Michael mentioned, there's over 6,000 years of corn, uh, packets and vials of seeds, photographs, documentary material, herbarium sheets, and some of our earliest uh, years of corn date due date to the early 1900s. So uh, as we mentioned before, it's down at Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis, uh, which is one of the, probably one of the top 10 botanical gardens in the world. And it has the third largest uh, herbarium in the world. We just uh, celebrated our 7 million specimen in the herbarium. So uh, Michael already mentioned that these seeds probably aren't viable. Uh, I mentioned this kind of early in the presentation because people always ask, well, can we grow the seeds? Well, probably not. Uh, a lot of people have probably seen this uh, article about germinating 2000 year old date seeds in Israel. And I'm not really convinced that uh, they are really as old as they say. And, you know, they're, lots of stories about uh, mummy seeds from the pyramids or old rock shelters in the southwest and and uh, Gary Nabhan's written a, an excellent article about this and usually when you trace down these stories they're just um, it's someone got some seeds from someone who got some seeds who got some seeds and uh, uh, so they're just uh, they're usually secondhand information. So the seed collection is, uh, the corn collection is, is housed in the herbarium in uh, these uh, 12 metal cases. Um, the collection was started at Missouri Botanical Garden, but uh, when Hugh Cutler retired in 1977, it was shipped up to the University of Illinois, the Crop Evolution Laboratory. It stayed that there for about 10 years and then it came back to Missouri Botanical Garden. So uh, uh, this is what the collection looks like before uh, we start working on it. So it's individual ears of corn, um, usually with tags and, and some 
information about how they were collected. So I'm going through these collections and I'm making sure that each ear has a tag, um, grouping ears by collection, photographing them, putting them in new bags, and then entering the information in Tropicos, which is our online database, which uh, I'll be talking about in a little bit. So we call it a corn collection, but uh, you know, every drawer seems to have a new surprise. So uh, uh, on the right are some uh, seeds from some Native American villages up on the shore of Lake Michigan. So it's the other part of the, the three sisters um, triad, the beans and the squash. And in the coffee can, uh, on the upper left is, is a bag of teosinte seeds, and this was added by Jack Carlin um, during the time the collection was up in Illinois. So there were a few things added to the collection while it was up in Illinois. And we have unusual things like obsidian from Teotihuacan uh, near Mexico City. Uh, one you know, I opened a, a drawer one day and found 268 vials of soybeans of all kinds of different varieties that were, uh, you know, collected in China and Japan between 1921 and 1951. Um, we have two boxes that contain basically whole corn plants. So uh, this particular box has actually has um, three different varieties of corn. And on the right, you see some very long ears, which are uh, similar to the hala corn, uh, J-A-L-A, that is grown in Mexico, that, that has some of the longest ears of corn uh, in the world. There's also herbarium specimens uh, associated with the collection. So they're standard ones, like the one on the right with uh, uh, pressed corn tassel and, and leaves. Uh, but Edgar Anderson was really interested in studying the whole plant. So uh, he did a number of these inclusive herbarium sheets that are shown on the left and that have measurements of corn tassels and how long the inner nodes are and photographs of the tassel on the plant and, and ears of corn. So it's, he used to refer to this, you know, trying to get information on about corn onto a herbarium sheet, like stabling a camel in a dog kennel. So most of the material we have dates from 1940 on when Anderson officially started the collection, but we have a lot of material uh, that's even earlier that was probably collected by plant explorers from the USDA and we're still not exactly sure when and how this material was added to the collection. And as far as uh, geographic coverage, so about 20% of our material is from Southwestern Native American tribes. We have a large collection from Mexico, from Peru, and then smaller uh, collections from elsewhere in the world. Um, and we have a little, but not a whole lot of European, Asian, and African material. So why might this collection be useful to seed savers? Well, there's a lot of old seed catalogs and lists of plants and things like, like uh, Elois Sturdivant's list of corn varieties that, um, that uh, he published in, um, 1899, which you know, lists a tremendous number of uh, different types of corn, but they're just verbal descriptions, very few illustrations. So if you want to figure out what North Dakota dent corn is, is like, it's kind of hard to do. So there are better things like um, this beautiful book, uh, volume three of uh, Vegetables in New York that shows over, has beautiful photographs of a uh, hundred different sweet corn varieties. Um, but those kind of resources are rather rare. So what the corn collection does offer is the actual ears of corn that you can look at and hold and take pictures of and, and test genetically and, and things like that. So here's a, uh, 
old collection of popcorns from uh, 1946. A lot of these uh, came from Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company. And this one at the bottom is particularly interesting. It's a, a branched ear of a mutation called Ramosa, where the ear of corn thinks it's behaving like a corn tassel. So you get multiple little ear, side ears uh, attached to the central ear. Uh, we also have a lot of unusual things like this is pod corn um, where it has these extremely long glooms that are around each little kernel so it's like each kernel has its own uh, corn husk. We also have a pretty good collection of open pollinated pre-hybrid uh, dent corns that uh, you know were commonly grown in the U.S. from about Civil War times up until you know, about 1930 when um, dent corns really started taking over. Um, so we also have a number of collections from the same area. And this is a collection of corn from geographer Campbell Pennington uh, from the 1940s. And this shows only two villages, but he has collections from uh, nine different villages in the area, all with uh, native names, uses, and uh, quite a bit of in interesting information. Uh, here's just an example of highland corn uh, from Peru from over 10,000 feet, which is kind of the maximum elevation that corn will grow at. And, and one of the real best features of, of the collection is that it shows the, the range of diversity at one particular point of time. So this is a, a collection from Guy Collins, who was a plant explorer for the USDA from um, Papago or Odom villages, uh, southwest of Tucson from 1914. And um, pay particular attention to these three years of, of white corn because they're about the only thing that persists. All these different varieties um, essentially have been lost. When Hugh Cutler went back and collected from the same area in 1953, he found a little bit of the white flower corns and they were already growing a lot of Mexican dents for uh, the local commercial market. So a lot of those you know, the sweet corns, the red corns, the blue corns and things have disappeared uh, over that length of time. And another advantage of the collection is that shows that how one particular type of corn will vary, you know, in different areas. So here's that Papago white flower corn that we just looked at. Here's an ear from Tepewan villages down in Chihuahua. Uh, you can see very similar types of corn grown by the Yuma and the Pima. And the same type of corn in about 700 AD made its way from the southwestern United States to the Midwest and the eastern United States. So you can see similar types of, of corn grown by the Cherokee and the Kiowa. Now, since I've been working on the collection, I wondered, first of all, how much of this material got into the USDA seed bank? And if the material did get into the seed bank, how similar is it to the original collection? So, um, so a number of the stuff was shared with the USDA seed bank. And, and we have this kind of unique set of collections that uh, come from Hugh Cutler in 1953. He bundled his family into the family station wagon drove around 20 villages in the Southwest collecting corn. And he made over uh, 64 different collections. And as you can see from these ears here, he shucked the kernels from a lot of the ears and sent them off to the USDA uh, DA seed bank. So it's possible to look at the original ears that still exist and what the material in the seed bank looks like now. Um, and in some cases, there seems to be a really good match between the original collection and the material that's available now. Whereas in some collections, this is uh, 
uh, Hamez rust colored dent. And if you look at the material that the USDA has now, you see a few more blue and yellow kernels kind of popping in there. So uh, this corn has to be grown out every you know, five to 10 years or so to keep the seeds viable. And each time you grow it out, there's a chance for cross-pollination or, um, you know, different genes to be expressed. So things in seed banks will change. And in some cases, uh, you know, the change is even a little bit more dramatic. So here's some white flower corn from Tsuki Pueblo. And if you look at what USDA has today, there's quite a bit more yellow and blue and red kernels kind of showing up. So somewhere there's been some, some changes uh, along the line have happened. And kind of when you look at that whole collection of, of 64 things, uh, first of all, I realized it was really important whether, you know, the collection sent to the seed bank was just one variety of corn, it was multiple varieties of corn. And, and at least one of the collections had up to four different varieties. And when you look at how similar the stuff in the seed bank is to the original collection, you know, about 35% of the material looks pretty good, but there's uh, some mixing that's going on. And in a few cases, they haven't uh, continually grown out the different varieties. So some of the original material has disappeared. Uh, and it's pretty similar if you look at the multi-variety collections. It seems like they've actually been maintained a little bit better that we don't really have any that, that are no longer grown by the USDA. So you can uh, either come down and visit the collection. Uh, these are some folks from a Maze Genetics Conference that were here in March. Um, or the easiest way to look at the collection is go to our online um, database, tropagos.org. And these links should all be available uh, outside this presentation. So um, there are different ways you can look for the material. You can look, uh, search either by collection or search by image. You don't need to register with the site. You can just look at the material. Uh, the key thing uh, to do is, is think advanced search because advanced search allows you to put in keywords and keywords will help you find the material. Uh, so this is a search bar. Type in corn collection, which is the most generic uh, keyword and then click on the search button. And this is an example of the results that you'll get. Uh, this also shows here another way to search. You can uh, open the street map and then it'll show different points or the uh, different points in the collection. You can cl uh, click on those points and you can see the material. Or you can uh, click on the collection number and that will open up uh, the information page for these. So it tells you who collected it, when they collected it, are there photographs of it yet? What the material looked like and uh, various different information about the collection. Uh, you can also search by image uh, from that home page. And this is what you get if you do an image search. And if you click on these thumbnails, it um, you know it opens up the picture of the type of corn if you click on collection details up here, it gets you back to that uh, collection detail page. I also mentioned you can search uh, by map. So it shows you the, the different points on the globe where the collections are located. If you hover on those and collect on the link, it will also take you to the details page. Um, are there other collections like this? Well, the, the largest collection of corn probably is the USDA uh, corn collection, but they only have pictures of kernels where we have pictures of ears. And for me, seeing the whole ear is much more useful than looking just at the kernels. Uh, the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian did have some material, but as you noted, 
note here on the card they don't have some of that stuff uh you know with collections you always have a problem of storage space and various folks have tossed out things like old corn cobs and things like that so uh there's a good collection at the university of indiana herbarium uh put together by paul weatherwax weatherwax it's not quite as large as our collection and it's not quite as organized but uh it's also very interesting. There are more specialized collections like this one at University of uh, Michigan. This was put together by Volney Jones and Al Whiting when they were doing a crop survey of the Hopis in uh, the 1930s. And so they have, you know, quite a bit of material up there also, but, you know, not 6,000 years from various different tribes like we do. So why is this collection potentially useful? It's been the source of numerous publications already. It inspired the Races of Maze book, books um, that were published in the 1950s. Um, most, usefully, the, uh, most useful though, it's a record of corn diversity at one particular place at one particular time. And you know it's hard to find information like that. You know, some of the seeds are still available from the USDA, uh, the National Seed Lab, and anyone can uh, access this information about the collection by just going to uh, Tropicos. And we're also going to do a little museum that they exhibit uh, at the garden in May of 2024. So basically, that's it. So I'd like to you know, thank all the people who grew the corn and, you know, all the people who kind of led me to the collection. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. That was uh, fantastic. Um, okay. I hope it's useful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it got, got me thinking of, uh, you know, your initial proposal about how this collection could benefit Seed Savers Exchange um as well um and so yeah it makes me think that it would be neat to kind of cross reference um varieties in our collection with what you have exactly um, mm -hmm. and and seeing you know i could i could see a situation where maybe you know we have a particular corn that you have maybe we don't have tons of information on it um it's an opportunity to gather more information and then it might be a neat one to then, you know, if we've got the variety and to to be able to grow it out um, here, you know, if we have a viable um, source of that and just, uh, yeah, kind of, um, because I found it interesting uh, to see, you know, those varieties the USDA still has and if those still resemble the originals that you have in those collections because as as you well know and people of this region know that uh um, the crossability of of our our corn we're working on is um is is it's a it's a a tough thing to keep pure and so of yeah. course we're up and we're up here hand pollinating right mm -hmm. and every time you grow it out different genes are going to be expressed so yeah. it's it you know, is it a hot, dry year? Then that's going to turn on different genes that are, you know, hidden in the corn, yeah. and the ears are going to look like like stuff that year, and they may look a little bit different. From they're going to be longer, or shorter, or, uh, uh, yeah. more completely pollinated, and and it gives a chance for those recessive genes to be expressed. So, yeah, yeah, that's going to be you know an interesting collection. Uh, interesting question and when we've got stuff from a known point of time mm -hmm. that we can do dna on mm -hmm. and we can look at heirloom collections and collections from the usda and and address that question of you know how much genetic drift has there been yeah. over that period of time and and you know how well have we saved that diversity yeah yep and that's uh yeah, like you say, going forward, it's it's 
that's the diversity that we must save. Because <laughs> exactly. as you say, all those gonna need it. <laughs> yeah, we're going to need all those possibilities that things like corn hold inside of them. Right. Well, we've already got some varieties you can grow in Alaska, but we're going to need more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just me being from Tennessee and being in Iowa now, just seeing just how things grow differently and in size and expression just between the two um, areas has been, you know, fascinating and neat for me. So, you know, when you consider location, time, climate, all the things, um, yeah, and what, what gets expressed? That's really one of the reasons these kind of collections started, because as European settlers moved out of the original 13 colonies, you know, the types of corn that they picked up from the local tribes and things like that, you know, when they got west of the Mississippi River, the, you know, the stuff from North Carolina just didn't do as well in Kansas and, and stuff like that. So, you know, smart corn breeders started collecting different types of corn from the local tribes and cross-pollinating it and trying to adapt it to the, uh, the new locations. And, and so that's really when, when folks like uh, Oscar Will at the, at the Will Seed Company, um, you know, you know, started going around and, you know, knocking on teepee doors and, and saying, Hey, you guys got any old corn? Yeah. <laughs> and we yeah. get apples up and. <laughs> well, and as, yeah, as those Eastern dent varieties, they kept bringing over here and trying to push in this region and yeah. they just weren't taken how they wanted them to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, um, but yeah, um, we're, we're growing a, a, um, a Shawnee Pearl Flint type um, oh. that uh, this year. So it's been really neat to see, you know, that grow up in this region. You know, it's, you know, it's been grown in the Dakotas for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just kind of neat to see one of those originals, you know, where there's a lot of branching going on and, and um, tillering or whatnot, but uh, um yeah, it's just neat to see that because down in Tennessee, it's all the, that big old tall dent corn down there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, so uh, just a fascinating um, corn in itself is just fascinating uh, with all its possibilities. And as you've shown with the maps, how it's, you know, reached so many different places and the variation through time and um, the different types. I've got a good friend Raphael Meyer that also presented with us this year uh, that does a lot of uh, corn work in Mexico and he has a particularness towards popcorn and uh, yeah he and, did a beautiful presentation so. yeah yeah so I love being surrounded in good corn folks it's just just an exciting topic and um, yeah I'm uh, I, I can't thank you enough for presenting this Charlie uh, that's wonderful and then uh, we'll have to uh, stay in touch and see what we can't do together around corn. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, when it comes time to put together our exhibit and stuff, we'd love to have some input from you folks up there. So absolutely. That sounds fantastic. All right. Well, Charlie, we'll stay in touch. And again, thanks so much for today. Wonderful presentation. And uh, thanks for all you do. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for all you folks do. And mm -hmm. Thanks for saving those seeds. Yeah, man, for sure. All right. Well, take care, Charlie, and we'll talk to you here soon. All right. Well, have a great day. Too.